All right, folks, welcome in to another edition of the Backwoods Bible Broadcast with your two hillbillies, Andrew Suter, pastor of the Bible Baptist Church here in Asheville, North Carolina, and Randy Keener, full-time evangelist out of New Manor Pudding Baptist Church in Marion, North Carolina, coming to you with another edition of the Backwoods Bible Broadcast. Brother Randy, how in the world are you? I'm doing wonderful. Can you still hear the hissing? A little bit, yeah. Ah, oh, man, hold on. I thought through this thing far enough away. Randy's, uh, yeah, it's not mine, I don't think. Randy's uh, iPad sometimes in his that, technology. Is that better? I think so. It may be mine. No, it's good. It's okay, gone cool. now. Cool, yeah, cool. no, it's, it's gone. All right. So everybody, hey, everybody do us a favor, like and share the broadcast. What I just did, Brother Randy. Yeah. Well, on my, I've, got to, on my Facebook. I've got to go on my actual computer. Can you see me when I'm doing this? Um, no, I can't. All I see is your face. Oh, well, that, that's what I was wondering. Oh, this, well. this is the Backwoods Bible Broadcast OG. OG? Yeah, we're OG. What does that mean? Uh, original. Original. Oh, yeah, we are. Yeah. And I figured out, I, I see, it's only taken us three years to get this technologically advanced. I've figured out that I can dim my screen. It takes the glare off my glasses. Oh, so, well, that's, uh, now what are you doing? I just lowered the glare on my screen. Oh. Like, like, oh. The, like, the, like you just, yeah, see there? See, can't see the glare on your glasses no more. Well, now I can't see you either. <laughs> well, oh, well, I can still see everything. All right, folks. Well, I can share the broadcast tonight. Well, we've got a, a I think this is a very mu good and much needed mm -hmm. broadcast. Yeah. Um, this is, we're going to be talking about study tips and methods, or as I put it, study tips and tools. Got to be alliterated, uh, preacher. Got to be. That's the first point. You know, if you're going to study, you got to alliterate everything. That's uh, the golden rule. Actually, yeah. I would say this uh, in all seriousness to any young preacher that's watching tonight. Never let your sermons suffer for sake of alliteration. I agree with that. And man, have I heard some sermons suffer for <laughs> alliteration's sake. Same. Like if you've got to say if you've got to preface a point and say now for alliteration's sake I this is this is my drop hand it to God. yeah just drop it I, I my hand to God I, I was sitting in a Bible college and a man was teaching through Revelation and he got down to where he got in Revelation nine where it talks about them demon locusts oh yeah and he was going through and and I can't remember all the ones. But every, everything he was talking about was started with the C. I mean, he just alliterated everything. And he would talk about, he would say C. He talked about their crowns. He talked about their, you know, I can't even remember. And then he talked about, and then he to the teeth, he said, and now we see, now for sake of alliteration, we see their chompers. And I was like, oh my gosh. <laughs> well, you know who told me that about never letting your sermon suffer for sake of alliteration? I'm I think I know. You're scared to ask? <laughs> yeah. Well, uh, he, he's with the Lord now, but it's it was Stinnett Blue. Oh, okay. Ma but, well, you know, sure Stinnett Blue. And everything. He did. He did. But I, I had noticed in his sermons, rarely ever was there a crazy, wacky, alliterated yeah. point that was thrown in. He, he was good about that. Now, I am preaching a message next week at Chad Reese's entitled The Muffin That Mangled Midian. <laughs> <laughs> where we're getting never let your never let your sermon suffer for sake of a title either. <laughs> <laughs> oh man. Well, we're going to talk about some of uh some of the methods, the study tips and tools of how to study the Bible. And I think it's I think it's so important not only to know how to study the Bible, but to have some tools with you. I mean, God has yeah. given some me and some good light. And so there's stuff you can do. There are certain methods you can use and certain materials you can use. See that alliteration preacher um, mm. that can help you when you're studying the Bible. So, Brother Randy, I did you have an outline that you had written down like a like a point that no. you had? had? No, I, well, I didn't write an outline or anything like that out, but um, I, here's what happened, okay? I was on a post online. It was a creation ministry, and, you, you know, they're not like us by any stretch of the imagination, but, mm -hmm. you know, good folks trying to do a good thing. 
and they asked a question trying God to keep their, their people heart. engaged. Yeah, the Lord knows their heart. <laughs> uh, you know, so that's good. Uh, but they asked a question. They said, what is your favorite method of Bible study? And they had a lot of response, but unfortunately, um, the response could be broken down into three primary categories. One was people saying that they didn't even know how to study, which really shocked me that people would even admit that. Mm -hmm. um, number two was people who were saying that they used a certain app to read with, or they use like an audio app. I mean, not studying whatsoever. They're either listening or reading the Bible. And there is a difference between studying and reading. My favorite study tool is Alexander Scorby. <laughs> oh, I mean, that's pretty much what some people were saying, except, you know, these aren't all King James people. So they're they're listening to the new guy with the lisp uh, to talk <laughs> about the Bible. Yeah. Um, and, and then the last group were people that, you know, they had some good ideas here and there. Uh, but then there was a lot of stuff mingled in with your guys um, like John MacArthur and uh, Piper and, and people like that, because uh, this this certain ministry, they do lean more towards the old SBC type mentality. Mm -hmm. So that was that was a three. And I was you know kind of shocked. But I'll tell you this. I've noticed even among young preachers that would be in our group. A lot of them know how to read commentaries, but they don't really know how to study it for themselves and get it out on their own. Yeah. And I'll be honest. I mean, some of them ain't even picking up commentaries anymore. Well, that's true. Let me say this. Jim Lentz preaches a very strong message um, entitled The Loyalty of Abishai, which you trust me, if, if you are weak need when it comes to preaching, this is not the message <laughs> to listen to. It is rough. I mean, it, he says things that I would never dream of saying behind a pulpit. But uh, if you if you are if you are um, prepared to hear, get your face ripped off and glued back on upside down, go listen to the loyalty of Abishai by Jim Lentz, L I N C E. And in that message, he starts out by saying, you know, talking about preaching and everything. It says, "I'm sick of hearing all this, um, all this top or what did he call it? Illustration preaching." He goes, I'm sick of hearing preaching on eagles and preaching on football and, you know, preaching on all this crazy. And he's right. It's crazy how, you know, people like uh, I, heard, I heard people somebody say one time. He said, I don't care what an eagle does. I don't care. I don't care what an eagle does. Um, I heard a preacher and I like this dude. And if I told you, I mean, you would know him. Maybe he's even some people on here. He's a great guy. Um He's originally from here, but he said, I heard a guy say, well, I heard a guy preach a message one time on a Krispy Kreme donut, and it was one of the best messages I ever heard. And I really challenged that notion. <laughs> <laughs> yes, uh, yes, I do as well. So anyway, but hey, I, I, I'll tell you this, Bill Grady, I got, I've got a few things here that I'm gonna, we're going to be talking about. I've got a few books and study helps. Yeah. But, Let's start with tools. Well, well, here's, well, here's what I was going to say. Okay. Um, Brother Grady has, in Given by Inspiration, which everybody knows, I highly, highly recommend Given by Inspiration by Brother Grady. Um, but in his book, Given by Inspiration, he has an entire chapter on how to study the Bible. And so whenever I am teaching about how to study the Bible or, you know, tips and tools, whatever, I use this chapter as an outline because, man, has it got some good stuff. So what we'll do it's okay, Brother Randy. We'll just use this chapter as an outline because some of the stuff you text me about beforehand, it's yeah. in there and some more. Okay, good. So, yeah. So, um, and I've got some different study tools on each one of these points here. Um, so the first one, Brother Grady mentions here on how to study the Bible, and this is a good one. And it's a real good one to start out with first because it's the law of first mention. Mm, yeah. Everybody should know this. I, I agree with that. <laughs> I like it. I agree with it. And I think I'd say it. I think I'd say it. Um, but I just don't think everybody does know this, unfortunately. No, but this is a great thing when you're studying the Bible, man. If if you will find the first time that a word is mentioned, yes. generally uh, throughout the Bible, the same connotation will be carried by that word. It will be used in a similar way all the way throughout the book. Mm hmm. Um, well, and, and so the law of first mention, there's a lot of I mean, you talk about some deep stuff. 
So, for example, the law, just to name a few of the law first mentioned, for example, the first time the word sinners is used in the Bible, it's in Genesis 13, 13, referring to the men of Sodom. The first time you find the word 13 in the Bible is also the first time you find the word rebel in the Bible, and that's in Genesis chapter 14 and verse, I don't have a Bible right in front of me, but verse 16, I think, but somewhere in Genesis 14, you have the first, the law first mentioned the first time the word rebel and the first time you, the word 13 is found. They're in the same verse. Um, this is a really good one. Um, if this is in Brother Grady's book that um, he's talking about Billy Graham denying hell. The only reference to hell in the Old Testament that includes the word fire in the same verse is Deuteronomy 32, 22, and that's the first time the word fire is mentioned in the Old Testament. And I think also the time, that, it's either the first time the word hell is mentioned or the first time the word fire is mentioned, um, but that's the only reference there. And then you can take that and run it all the way through that hell is connected with fire in the Bible, not just the grave like the Jehovah's Witness say. Mm -hmm. What are some of your laws of first mention? Well, you, uh, you, you, you took mine on Genesis 13, 13. Oh. That, that, that's where I was going, but that's good. Um, well, uh, but the, the general principle is there with whatever you're using. Just whenever you're studying a topic, find the first time it's mentioned. Yeah. Uh, here's just a few nuggets for you. Um, to, to get you thinking on it. Um, first time the word holy is ever mentioned in the Bible, it's dirt. Oh, take off the, your shoes from off thy feet for the place where thou standest is holy ground, Exodus 3. The first time the word love is mentioned in the Bible is found in Genesis 22, and it's the relationship between a father and his son. Um, and also the first time you find the word repent um, in the Bible, it's God doing it in Genesis 6. Um, it's a change of mind. So there's a lot of interesting laws of first, first mention in there. And also, so the tool for this, Brother Randy, and I meant to text Brother Mann and tell him we were going to be doing this, but the absolute, no other, no other one needed is these two volumes. If you can see, these are thick books. Wrong way. These are thick books. These are right here. First Mention Nuggets in the King James Bible by Kevin Meehan. Here's volume one. This is Genesis to Esther. And here's volume two, Job to Revelation. And these are big. You can find these at Amazon.com. Just type in Kevin Mann, M-A-N-N. -N. If you don't, Brother Mike Gray said that this was some of the best reference material he's ever had in his life. So that hands down is what you need to get if you're wanting to study the law first mentioned there. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so those are definitely good points. Um, there's a lot of things like that, uh, especially when you get on board with the numbers deal. Um, it, it's really mocked today. But when you start studying those numbers, uh, you're going to see some crazy coincidences. Uh, if, if that's not legit, you know, too, there's a lot of proof to the contrary. Too many, too many to deny way too many yeah. to deny and we'll get to numerology it's in this outline here the okay. next the next one that um the next one that grady has here is similitudes in the bible hosea twelve ten says i have also spoken by the prophets and i have multiplied visions and used similitudes by the ministry of the prophets hey and before before we get too far away because yeah um these are things that I, I would put more in the categories of tips. What I meant by tools was like actual study tools. Um, everybody's going digital now, but I would still recommend um, it, as far as tools go, get a concordance to yeah. keep at your house. Get you. I mean, if you're going to do it online, you're going to use an app. That's fine. I do a lot, but you know, try and invest, get you a concordance and, that way you can go back, you can look and see all these things. And there's a strong concordance, a young concordance, and a crudence concordance. Right. And if you want to know which one you ought to use, strong for the strongs, youngs for the youngs, and crudence for the crudes. Yes. So. And, and if you have uh, an 1828 Webster's Dictionary, a strong exhaustive concordance, and a King James Bible, you'll never exhaust any of them. I agree with that. <laughs> hey, man. Um <laughs> Yeah, I mean, here, look, 
I, you can download a Bible app, any Bible app, and, simp- and all of them have a search engine. My favorite is the Olive Tree Bible Reader. Olive Tree Bible Reader. You can go on there. I have downloaded for free. They have an entire section where you can download public domain books. Um, they've got a ton of English translations, different translations in different languages. I just downloaded. They just put it on there the entire works of Josephus for free on that Bible app. Flavius Josephus. And they've got, I've got sermons by John Knox, Charles Wesley, John Wesley. It's crazy. So anyway, uh, get your Bible app and you, and it's a great way to look at the law. First mention, you just type in a word, see the first time it's used. Mm-hmm. That's a big deal. That is a big deal. All right, moving on. Similitudes, using things that are in the likeness or resemblance of something. Uh, we, this would also, I guess, be called types or typology. Um, boy, I have heard some people really... Um, well, he, he separates similitudes and typology here. Um, he says uh, things that are alike, and I guess I can see it here, uh, the difference. So he uses, for example, um, he shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water, um, is not my word, like as a fire. Um, all that kind of stuff. So similitudes, comparing things to other things. Just make sure you don't do it on eagles because that would be real bad. <laughs> yeah, because we hate that. We well, hate that. well, here's the problem when you get with something like that is a lot of the times it's really heavy on picture and really light on Bible. Right. If you're going to draw a picture, that that's perfectly fine. But just give it some Bible to go along with it. There's a guy that we were talking about the other day, um, preaching at a local radio station, preached a message on the Eagle, read one verse, and yeah. that was all. Were we there together? Were we there together that night? I doubt it. Okay. <laughs> I doubt I was there. <laughs> Somebody was with me, and it literally, I'm not joking, if he would have had some points, like some scriptures to quote along, like he didn't even have to have us go there. If he would have just quoted some verses, but he literally, literally read Isaiah 40, 31, and then just like told a bunch of stories about eagles and like mm-hmm. how they act and stuff, and everybody was shouting and crying, and then the altar was flooded. <laughs> and I was just like... <laughs> Well, yeah, it, it's helpful if you have Bible. There's uh, an old anecdote, and I'm sure it's probably true, about John R. R. Rice sitting there, and he's you know furiously scribbling on, on a piece of paper, and someone walks up and says, Brother Rice, what you doing? And says, I'm trying to find some scripture to go with this outline. Uh, <laughs> you know, I, I think there's probably a lot of truth to that. So yes. at, at least get you some some good verses to paint those pictures with. I agree. All right, his next one here, you've already mentioned it, but the next one is the Webster's 1828 Dictionary. Mm -hmm. And that is the quote-unquote standard for dictionaries if you need to look up a word in the King James Bible. (laughs) Yes, it's it's big. You can find this online too. Yeah, for free. Yeah, it's free online. Personally, I like having copies, but, you know, not everyone's like me. You can go online. You can get you a, a concordance or a search engine same thing get you 1828 on a website for free so you've already got two tools and haven't even paid a dime now you do have to be careful though with the definitions in there that that dictionary is not perfect and there are some places in there where you'll get real gommed up if you let the webster's dictionary define your definition for example webster's 1828 dictionary in dealing with hail never mentions fire Mm. Um, I'm trying to think of some other ones. Reprobate. The definition of reprobate is wrong in a, in a Webster's 1828 dictionary. You want to be careful with repentance in a Webster's dictionary. Yeah. Because yeah. It, it, it runs you down about four different references that it, that it could be, and, and you could use it four different ways, um, you know, just like many other words. But when you're dealing with salvation, you better have the right one. <laughs> I agree with that. But it is good. I mean, because let's just admit, I mean, I don't, I don't know anybody that does have a hard time admitting this. We admit it. The King James Bible does have some archaic words in it. Okay. Mm-hmm. I mean, shambles. When we think of shambles, we think of like a bomb dropping on a place and the place being left in shambles. But in 1611, that was a term used for the marketplace. 
um, you know, different things like that. A bees of crisping the bee pins. Yeah. You know, I will, I will sweep thee with the bees of destruction. You know, that's just another word from a br for a broom. Um, so I do think it's helpful to, to know that, but God does not allow us to change these words. If you study first Samuel nine, brother Gip has a great video on this, on what's the big deal about the King James series that he did where in Genesis first, excuse me, first Samuel nine, they're talking about the prophet and it says, and a prophet in those days was called a seer. And then when it goes down and tells the rest of the story, it doesn't change it to a prophet to fit the modern day reader. It keeps the story saying seer. Mm -hmm. And so the archaic word there is still used, even though the definition is given. And I think that's a great reason why you ought to get an 1828 dictionary to look up how the words was used. I mean, because that was only what, a hundred, a little over 200 years after the translation of the King James Bible when that came out. So you're going to get some great stuff in how the definitions of those words were used. Yes. Now, as far as just the tools in your possession, um, not not the continual tips we're going to give you, but those three things right there, uh, you can go a long way with a good concordance, a dictionary, and your Bible. Yes. So, uh, you know, if you're sitting down and you're studying a passage or you're looking at a verse, you know, kind of where study starts, especially as a beginner, is you see something you don't understand and you take the time to find out what it actually means. Mm-hmm. And the two, the two ways that you can do that is, first and foremost, is you find out how the Bible defines that word, how the Bible uses it. But if there's still some gray area for you there, then go to your dictionary. Absolutely. And you can download on an iPad. Now, I downloaded mine for free, but I think they charge two ninety nine now. You can download, download a Webster's 1828 Dictionary uh, app to have that you don't have to use the internet for if you don't have internet on your iPad. Um, or you can pay how much you pay for that one you got there. They're, they're expensive. I bought it a long time ago though. It was, it was like 80 bucks a long time ago. Right. I think they're upwards of a hundred, 120 now, if I'm not mistaken. So they're not cheap. Mm -hmm. All right, let's move along here in brother Grady's book. Then he has for the next one, he has typology, typology, Bible types, using people as, as types in the Bible. Explain that one, Brother Randy. So this is one that really we grew up with because uh, this was a, an easy <laughs> this was one. Most, this was the most profound one we ever heard, really. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, and there are some really profound truths found in typology. But, you know, the old mountain preachers, they would go back and they would see what they were looking for and they'd find a story and relate it, you know, either to the New Testament or relate it to, to personal life. But when uh -huh. we're looking, going to add a type or a picture in the Bible. For example, I've got uh, A.W. Pink gleaning in Exodus Ooh. behind me. Yeah, I know. <laughs> but he's got some good types in there. Uh, I've one heard. Of, I've heard. Yeah, one of my favorites, and you know this one, is when he talks about the mercy seat, and he talks about the, uh, the length and the width, but there's no depth, and that's a picture of God's mercy having no depth, no bottom to it. So mm -hmm. there's stuff like that. Um, of course, all of your feasts in Israel are types uh, of mm -hmm. different things, and you can go very, very deep in those. Uh, Passover, a type of the crucifixion. Um, Atonement Day, really a type of the crucifixion from God's perspective. Uh, I, I know it can also uh, represent other things dealing out with the millennium, but, uh, you know, there's several pictures in all of these things. Um, yeah. Canaan. Now, you know, a lot of those old guys would say now, now Canaan's never a type of heaven. It's well, a type of victorious Christian life. Yeah. Cause there's still battles fought in heaven. That's <laughs> right. But I think, I think Canaan can still be a, a picture of heaven to a degree. Well, the author of Hebrews sure thought that in Hebrews 3. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but, but every, you know, one thing that they said, and I'm not sure this is 100% true, but I think it does carry true a lot, is that types do have eventual breaking points. Uh, you know, you're only going to ring that thing out so far before. The only one I have never heard that has a breaking point is Joseph. Now, I know that's what you're going to say. And, and I've got Kevin Mann's book right here. Um, the, 
it's called the Lord Jesus Christ in Genesis. Um, Joseph, the greatest type of Christ in the King James Holy Bible. Mm -hmm. And um, you can get this one on Amazon too under Kevin Mann's. He has got some crazy good stuff. He goes through the entire story of Joseph. I mean, you're, if you read this whole book, you're going to read the entire life of, of Joseph from Genesis 37 all the way to Genesis 50. He's got some crazy good types. I've, I'm, if I'm remembering correctly, there's, maybe there was a time where he lied, though, maybe. I'm thinking of a random place where he lied. But as far as the only one that never seems to have a breakdown is Joseph. Mm -hmm. So um, I'll tell you one of my favorite types. Okay, also use types that the Bible tells you are types. For example, yeah. Jesus was the last Adam. Yeah. So that means there's going to be some typology there with with the first one. Okay. Yeah. Jesus is going to show you everything that Adam wasn't in right. that type. But then there's Jesus being the rock that followed him in the wilderness. Right. Yeah. Um, you know, I am the door. I am the bread. All that kind of stuff. Um, you can use that. Uh, when Paul uses um, ty Paul uses typology, Paul uses scripture plumb out of context sometimes mm -hmm. to make New Testament application and practice. So for sure, typology. But you got to be careful with this typology. I, I mean, we, we've heard some crazy stuff, Brother Randy, <laughs> with typology. Yeah. We we heard we heard um, one preacher who is a great preacher who is uh, sick of these Baptist popes um, say one time that uh, that why some men never find the I, door. Yeah, I knew that's what you're gonna say. Uh, he preached a message about how that the men of Sodom were strick, stricken with blindness and they spent time groping to find the door. And he, he said, some of you, you're going to wait so long, reject God for so long, that he's going to smite you with spiritual blindness. And you'll be trying to find the door like a blind man, but you'll never find it. Never be able to get saved, no matter how hard you try. Because, you know, raping two men is just like heaven. I mean, that's when you think of the type there. It's ridiculous. It's just well, every time has its breaking point. Every, every, every time. <laughs> and that one breaks hard, preacher. <laughs> it's ridiculous. Uh, I, heard, I mean, I've heard, I heard one guy talk about after Samson laid with the whore and then took the gates of the city and went up to the top of the, and carried him up to the top of the hill, that that was a type of Jesus taking the gates of hell to the top of Calvary. I heard that message. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, so you... <laughs> It's like, oh, anyway, but yeah, so just be careful with your typology, folks. Mm -hmm. Well, okay, let, let me say it like this before we move on, because I actually preached a message at the blowout last year, dealing up with a lot of types. A and before we move on, I think I'm obligated to say that the type doesn't create the doctrine. Okay, just because there's something going right. on doesn't mean yes. we can yes. formulate yes. our doctrine from it. We find the doctrine. And then the types or the pictures undergird the the plain, clear doctrine that you see. Right. Basically, folks, if you don't have a New Testament verse to back up whatever type you're trying to make, don't don't do it. And you would think that that would go without saying, but trust me, it doesn't. Right. So. What well, you know, you can even find some types. Now, this was pointed out to me. Now, M most of your types come from the historical aspects of the Old Testament, uh, as they're painting pictures of what's taking place in the New. You can find the same thing in the Book of Acts, pointing forward to the tribulation. Right. I don't know if you've ever seen that. Caleb Hickam's actually the one who showed it to me. No, I've never seen that. Well. Yeah, start studying the book of Acts and, and you'll see how that that piece of New Testament history will paint pictures of what's in the future prophetically. Well, and that goes with Old Testament stories and passages. For example, in the book of Amos chapter 7, God tells them that the wanderings of the Jews in the Old Testament when in the wilderness will be very similar to what will happen during the same things that will happen during the tribulation period. Mm -hmm. um, you find that name is seven. So yeah, I can I can go along with that for sure. Are right, you got anything else to add to the typology? No, I think that's good. Hey, this is a really good one that I don't think we we now us, uh, mountain preachers 
have done this a lot. Oh yeah. And I think one of the reasons why is because of, of, of a Schofield Bible, Schofield Bible um, is Bible names. Study those Bible names. Mm -hmm. That's, that's the next one on, on brother Grady's list. And if you've got now, I'll tell you, I'm, I'm a Ruckman reference Bible kind of guy. I like the Ruckman reference Bible a lot. Now, but I've got a Schofield here, and I'm going to tell you one of the greatest benefits of having a Schofield Bible is in the back. One of the one of the things that it has, it has every single name in the Bible listed with the definition and the references of where it's found. And one of do you know like one of the like the 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 famous place where like the name is such a the names just make the story. Mm -hmm. May Malon and Chilion. Right. Yeah. Ruth Ruth chapter one. Malon and, and this is in the in the Schofield Bible. So if you got a Schofield Bible, and you go to Joshua Judges Ruth. All right. There we go. Sometimes I have to Matthew Mark Luke Ruth. Matthew, Matthew Mark Luke Ruth. Um, <laughs> Ruth chapter one. Um, they go down, they leave Bethlehem Judah, which means the house of bread and praise. And they go down to Moab, uh, which is the wash pot of God. And they have two sons, Malon and Chilion, which means sick and pining. Now, Naomi means pleasant, but by the time she gets back in Genesis one, back to Bethlehem Judah, she says, call me no more Naomi, but Mara, which means bitterness. So just by studying the names there, you've got a message that you can preach about how leaving the house of bread and praise and going down to the wash pot, uh, you know, will, you'll come back all bitter and you'll have children down there that'll be sick and pining. And the surprise is all that comes right out of your Bible. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> the crazy thing is, is, and I know it's not alliterated, but it's still good. <laughs> yeah. Well, uh, I think it's Seth uh, that means appointed. Mm, maybe. And th well, there's a lot to that with Cain and Abel. Mm, yeah. You know, you know, in, in actuality, um, Eve, in all probability, and, and there's some things you can tie this together with. She thought that Cain or Abel would have been the fulfillment of what God had promised. Genesis 3.15, right. And the whole deal with Cain killing Abel led to the naming of Seth, which means appointed. Mm. Because Abel's gone, so she's saying, well, here's the one that takes this place. And that, that's what that name means. Well, na names meant something in Bible days. Names weren't just arbitrarily given. Um, and the amount of people that God pre-named, I mean, God, the Bible, people are named that for a reason. The names of people are recorded for a reason in the Bible. Now, sometimes you're just going to, there, there's not going to be anything there that God's going to reveal to you. There's going to be other times where the names of places actually become really, really interesting and can add a very colorful insight or flavor to a message. Um, and so study those names out. Get you a Schofield Bible. That that is the do you know, I don't know of another study tool like that. Mm -mm. Um a, a Schofield Bible. No. Having well, all those names in the back with the definitions. Well, my old boss used to tell me that if there was one book he could have in the entire world, it would be a Schofield Bible. And and we can follow up at the end, maybe talk some about these different study Bibles, uh, because they are great tools to have. But, mm -hmm. you know, one of the things I hear Brother Grady do a lot is he adds kind of those little punches in there. Like he'll put uh, in a message, he'll just randomly drop some of those names and just make a comment in passing. You know, one of the things I've noticed from these great Bible expositors is when they preach, it's like every sentence is designed to pack a punch. It all means mm -hmm. something. And they just they pack it full of information. So, you know, even yeah. if you're not going to develop a whole sermon or a whole thought or if you're studying, you're not a preacher or a teacher and you're just studying, you're not developing a whole thought. Uh, it's interesting just to jot that information down while you're going through. Yeah, absolutely. I agree with that. All right. Let's move along here. So the next one that Brother Grady has in the book. Hey, everybody do us a quick favor. Like and share the broadcast. Hey, we tonight. also need some reviews. Now, me told me that. Uh, I've not looked at them myself, but I'm sure it couldn't hurt. 
uh, if some folks wouldn't mind to give us a review on the broadcast and share it. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. You you can tell we're talking about a uh, very, um, uh, uh, you know, if we were talking about, if we were going to talk about what we were going to talk about tonight, Randy, we wouldn't have only 35 viewers. <laughs> That's right. Well, everybody's quiet too. And the reason they're quiet is because they're eating, they're chewing right now, Andrew. Yeah. Amen. <laughs> have you heard that? <laughs> oh yeah. Well, it, and it may just be because they ain't got nothing to contribute to what we're talking about because it's all new to them. Well, anyway. No, I heard Brother Allen say one time, he said he used to get really upset when people would shout during singing and not preaching. But then he realized that it's not polite to talk with your mouth full. <laughs> <laughs> well, I can. Yeah, I mean, that's just as true as anything else I've heard before. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, I've heard a lot dumber analogies made. So. Uh, hey, the next one here is our favorite and the one we get ridiculed over. Are you still with us, Randy? Randy, are you there? Randy has departed. If anybody can see or hear Randy, let me know. Am I alone? Okay. Can you, he's, somebody tell me if you can still hear and see me. Can you still hear and see me? Hello. All right. Well, Randy comes. Whoop. And there I am all by myself now. All right. Well, hopefully you can still hear and see me. Hey, on. Hey, on. He's coming back. He's coming back. I'm pretty sure that was you because nothing okay. happened on my end. Well, your face, it just. I that's what happened with your face. Oh, okay. but everybody's saying they can still hear and see me. Okay. Well, I got you now. Okay. All right. We're now, well, what was the last thing you heard? Uh, uh, uh. Okay. Well, what I was saying is, is now we move on to the next one where this is, this is probably my favorite, but boy, it is the one that we absolutely get raked over the coals for. Yeah. Oh my gosh. Numerology. Mm-hmm. And we're going to skip some of these. I think we ought to skip the threefold application and go right to cross-referencing after this one. Um, but man, numerology is one of the most... I, here's the thing. Unless I'm teaching on it, I never really throw a lot of numerology in there. But man, numerology, sure. Hey, listen, all you preachers out there, um, okay, eating... I, I like eating chicken. Okay, I'll, I will eat just like plain chicken. But boy, I sure do like it when my wife puts like garlic and parsley and all that kind of stuff on the chicken. Okay. Spice up your messages a little bit and throw some little nuggets in there. I mean, have you ever chicken heard nuggets? A little chicken nuggets. <laughs> throw some chicken nuggets on top of that chicken breast. Okay. Um, throw some numerology nuggets in there every now and then. Yeah. Well, that that's exactly what I was trying to say before with Brother Grady. Right. Yeah. 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 You know, he he'll he's got like a main course coming, but he throws you a few little things that you can take home and think about besides the main course. Yeah. I mean, some people some people broil their. I mean, I used to grow up eating broiled steak. My mama would just put a steak in the in the oven, and we just eat them like that with like ketchup. Okay. But then I had a pan seared with garlic and butter and tie on it and all that time. However, you say that word. And it was delicious. So I like eating steaks just out of, out of the oven with ketchup. But boy, if you can put some spice on that and flavor mm -hmm. and some herbs, that's what I like. And so, so many people, and I'm just going to rant here for just a second. So many people, preachers, they just, I don't know. You can, Lee Davis used to tell us before he passed, um, well, a long time before he passed, that you there's two types of preachers there's preachers who read and there's preachers who don't and the way you tell the difference is listen to them preach that's the truth yeah so i i mean a little nugget so numerology brother randy what's some of your favorite number nuggets <laughs> well, let me just say this before we move on i, okay. I don't know how many times I, i've preached somewhere and apparently i look real dumb uh but i don't know <laughs> how many times i've preached somewhere and walked down and had a comment 
either exactly like this or along these lines, they would say, uh, you preach like you've been educated. <laughs> I was like, like I went went to school, you know, like elementary. Uh, but yeah, if you just read some books, it will help you. I agree with that. Uh, one of the books that you can read in this topic is I brought Kevin. Kevin, there are two things that just you're not going to beat um, with with Kevin May. Like you're not going to find anything better on the subject of law first mention or on, on numerics, biblical numerics. Um, he has an entire, from the number one to 13, he has books on, and this is, this is, look, this alone is just the number 13. And it's not like, you know, 22, 22 point font. I mean, this is, it's loaded with material. Mm -hmm. What is some of your favorite number nuggets? Um, I don't know. Uh, okay. <laughs> yeah, I, I don't know. Um, here's one of my here's one of my favorites. Okay, okay, thirteen. There's so much in there about thirteen. So there's like some undeniable okay. ones, right? So your favorite so three, thirteen. Three is pretty undeniable. I think five, the number of deaths, pretty undeniable. Six, the number of man. Seven, the number of perfection. And then thirteen is pretty stinking undeniable. That there is something, and all the other ones I believe are there too. But these are just really, really, really strong. 13, the number of rebellion. God is mentioned every sing, in every single verse in the first 12 chapters, first 12 verses of the Bible. The first verse where God does not show up is verse 13. Um, you know, Judas Iscariot, 13 letters. Antichrist shows up in, in, in Revelation 13. There, I mean, on and on and on and on it goes. Um, another one of my favorite that I always love to show people is Six being the number of man. Man was created on the sixth day. There's been 6,000 years of human history. Um, and you have Romans. So the sixth book of the Bible is Joshua, the first book named after a man. And also the sixth book of the New Testament is Romans. So if you take the sixth verse or sixth book, Romans, the sixth chapter, the sixth verse, and the sixth word, Knowing this, that our old man. So the sixth word of the sixth verse, of the sixth chapter of the sixth book of the New Testament is man. That there's and and also he pointed this out on the broadcast. There are six times in Romans where the word man is the sixth word, and that one in Romans six six is the sixth occurrence, the sixth and final occurrence. Mm. Yeah. Well, there was there was one. Well, when you said what's my favorite, I thought you meant like a personal one. Um, I had to pull I, like I went and pulled out a sermon to find it. So here's one that I found that okay. I, that I like. So atonement is mentioned 81 times in Scripture. Out of these times, 80 are in the Old Testament contained in 69 verses. OK, you following me? So okay. there's 69 verses in the Old Testament that have the word atonement in it. The 70th time and the final verse that contains the word atonement is Romans 5.11. And not only so, but we also joy in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom we have now received the atonement. So, uh, you know, uh, another thing to look at when you're doing this is multiples of a number. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense what I'm saying? Are you tracking yeah. that? Yeah. Okay. So, yeah, that that's one. Uh, also, to go along with that, atonement is mentioned 69 times in the Old Testament because it had to be done over and over and over again. When you get to the New Testament, it's only mentioned one time. Mm. Yeah, there's a number nugget. Number nugget. Um, <laughs> and and really, I mean, it's just there. There's so much of that stuff in the King James Bible, and it only works in the King James Bible. Yeah, I found one when I was studying Acts, but I can't remember what it was, and it was real good. Um, I'll tell you one that I found um, in Revelation thirteen eighteen, mm -hmm. where you have the you can it talks about the mark of the beast. Mm -hmm. um, and, it, and it talks about 666. 
Um, Genesis or excuse me, Revelation 13, 18, one plus three plus one plus eight equals 13. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That um, is there's, one. yeah, there's just, there's tons of stuff like that. Tons of stuff. Um, and then you have, of course, the number 13, but then you have in verse 18 where it talks about six, six, six. Well, 18 is three sixes. So there's just all sorts of stuff, but you need to get, people need to get Kevin Mann's book. You need to order all of his books, but especially his number nuggets and his law first mention, because those are just super, super good. You got any more on this, Randy, on the numerology or numerics, whatever you want to call it? No, I, I was looking for that one. I had actually sent it to Brother Mann that I found in the book of Acts, but I can't find it. Uh, uh, but it, it's uh, it, it's another one of those. It, you know, another cool thing is like Genesis 13, 13. You can find stuff like that if you look up pairs of verses like that. Or I'm sure you mentioned um, John 6, 66. Yeah, many of his disciples went, went back and followed him no more. Yeah, well, here's one I found sitting in church. If you, have, if you take half of that, which, you know, three is the number of reality or the number of the Trinity. If you take half of 666, John 333 gives a good illustration of how a man saved during the tribulation. John 333 says, He that hath received his testimony hath set to his seal that God is true. And so when you get to the book of the Revelation, you're going to read a lot uh, about the testimony of Jesus Christ and also those who are sealed by God. Mm, yeah, that's a good one. All right, folks, we've got our final one here. And this is probably the most important one and the greatest. So, so okay, and, I, and we'll tell you the greatest tool to get on it. So the last one here that Brother Grady mentions is cross-referencing. Mm -hmm. Good night. This is the, I mean... Cross-referencing is the key to understanding the Bible. Yes. It, it hit me, too, because I, I was writing a little post on what I was talking about earlier. It's important that you start by cross-referencing with words, obviously. Yes. Obvious, yes. But as you progress, you do get to the point where you cross-reference thoughts, Instead, yes. And not just words like you, you can take a thought and you can connect two things that are very similar uh, that are taking place. Kind of like in Matthew 24, where we read about the eagles being gathered together with the body. You, you mm -hmm. know, if you don't cross reference, then you're going to have to make something crazy up like that body's the body of Christ. And we're eagles that are eating the we're body. eagles eating the body. <laughs> uh, and that that's something that a preacher and really said. Yeah, and even though that sounds really, really Catholic, don't worry, it was just Steven Anderson. So. Right. <laughs> so, uh, but that's ob but that's obvious the the Battle of Armageddon and right. the birds. Yeah. Well, see, and, and that's the thought. You know, you may not be able to cross reference eagle exactly, but you can find a lot about birds in the day of the Lord. Right. And cross referencing is is found right in the Bible. First Corinthians chapter 12 or excuse me, first Corinthians chapter two, verses number 12 and 13, um, where it says, now we have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit of God, which is of or, but the spirit, which is of God, that we might know the things that are freely given to us of God which things also we speak, not in the words which man's wisdom teacheth, but which the Holy Ghost teacheth, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. That's a comparison. All cross-referencing is, is comparison. Mm -hmm. um, I, you know, one of the big ones that I like to show, and it's not really like a, a great profound thing, but it just, it really drives home the importance of cross-referencing. Let me get my Bible here. Um, is, is Revelation chapter number one, we find that uh, John is on the Isle of Patmos for the testimony of Jesus Christ. And I've, I'll ask random people, you know, that I'm talking to and teaching this topic. Does he? So, what is the testimony of Jesus Christ? And you know, they'll say like, you know, uh, you know, his testimony. You know, he was he he got put on on the island because he was giving his testimony. You know, and all that kind of stuff. Or you know, the gospel or the truth of you know whatever. Well, he says he was put on there for the testimony of Jesus Christ in verse number nine. 
Well, we don't find out what the testimony. And, and then there are people, the, the people during the tribulation period, the 144,000, they also have the testimony of Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. Well, we don't find out what that is until we get all the way to Revelation 19. And because you can make that interpret however you want to. But until you get to Revelation 19, verse number 10, it says, I am thy fellow servant and of thy brethren that have the testimony of Jesus Worship God, for the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. So we find there that one verse interprets another, cross-referencing, comparing spiritual with spiritual. Mm -hmm. And that's the verse I always use to teach that, that cross-referencing will, will reveal truth to you. Yeah, well, there's one I'm looking for that Brother Daring gave. Uh, Matthew 12, 32, cross-reference to Hebrews 6. Is that it? Uh, about the world to oh, come? Oh, hang on, hang on. Yeah, no, 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 no. It's, it's, it's not, he, it's, it's, the, um, it's the unpardonable sin. Yeah, that, that's what I was talking about. Oh, Matthew 12, 32. I'm thinking, of, gosh, I'm in a, a different world. Yeah, Matthew 12, 32, that, that you don't have forgiveness in this world, neither the world to come. And mm -hmm. it's talking about the kingdom age. And then Hebrews 6, talking about that falling away, they tasted the powers of the world to come, the kingdom age, making that a tribulational reference. Yeah. That, that blew my mind. I, I know. And that's that's from Darren Penland. So I, I want to give him the credit for that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's amazing stuff right there. I'll tell you a truth bomb that we had last week that it was the result of cross-reference was what Brother Chad said, Chad Reese. Oh, my gosh. Yeah, the alive thing. Mm -hmm. That was unbelievably good. We, one of the ones that Grady points out, you know, in his book, is that when a man's ways please the Lord, he maketh even his enemies to be at peace with him. Mm -hmm. and the Bible says that the last enemy that shall be destroyed is death. So a man who, if you, if a man who's saved or his ways please the Lord, he even makes death to be peaceable. <laughs> That's pretty good. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so. It, to, lest we overcomplicate it, what we're saying with cross-referencing is you just want to find all the places in the Bible that word is used and read them. Yeah, I agree. And and that's why, you know, I hear a lot of these guys, listen, a lot of these neo-fundamentalists and neo-evangelicals and all these guys who, you know, act like they're so much deeper than their independent Baptist forefathers. And I'm not saying that their independent Baptist forefathers were like giants in the faith of, you know, of Bible knowledge. But they'll, they'll oftentimes bash topical preaching. Topical preaching does not have to be shallow. In fact, good act, actual topical preaching is nothing but cross-referencing and comparing what the Bible says about the subject from different passages. I mean, what a lot of these guys call topical preaching is just not even really preaching. It's just like storytelling and, you know, yeah. all that kind of stuff. Well, you know, I've taken the covenants for the past eight or nine weeks and been dealing with these. I'm getting ready to finish them up on uh, church instead of church, uh, you know, church after <laughs> church on Sunday nights. Um, and, and they have been railed on by some people, but it wasn't because there wasn't any material there. Really? Uh, well, there was one I, I had. a Well, there were two. Actually, I had some guys that uh, weren't too happy with. But the problem was neither of them could say anything. The, the first one, um, I had misspoke on something and he called me out on Twitter. So I went to him personally, asked him a oh, bunch DMCO. of questions. Yeah, DMCO. And he just wouldn't he wouldn't even touch it after that, because uh, what I brought up to him was Martin Luther felt the same way I do about the book of James, except instead of embracing it, Martin Luther wanted to throw it out of the school and yeah, light a stove and all that. And, uh, you know, I, I asked for a comment on that, which I, I never got, but, um, it, it, you know, it, it wasn't for lack of material, but it, it, it was topical. The topic was the covenants. Mm -hmm. So topical preaching doesn't, mean that there has to be nothing there. Just unfortunately, men use that that path so that they don't have to put much there. Yeah, I agree. Or if they that. have a rant, you know, that's an easy way to rant or to, you know, get people to give more money or to get people on the buses. 
uh, you know, and not that any of these things are necessarily wrong in and of themselves, but it, it's an easy way to be able to direct a message at an idea instead of actually utilizing scripture to promote a doctrine. Right. Right. It, you know, like Jesus wept. Why was he weeping? Well, he's weeping because you weren't soul winning. And he's weeping because you weren't tithing. He's weeping because you weren't coming to church. Okay. That, that is, that, that is what all the modern day neo evangelicals, neo fundamentalists are calling topical. So I started preaching. That's not really topical. I started preaching when I was nine. So people, I hope, will cut me a little slack on this one. But, you know, the Bible says, let the redeemed of the Lord say so. I had a message on the redeemed of the Lord are saying so. They say so about soul winning, like so what? <laughs> <You know? laughs> be careful. There may be a high rank and I have be evangelist when we get a hold of this. <laughs> well, uh, yeah, I may be preaching at the sword next year. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, way to go. Let's end and, this broadcast with a bang. And then I'll be looking down on you. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and then you'll be a platform preacher. <laughs> I will. I will be a platform preacher. <laughs> oh, geez. Well, um, so yeah, <laughs> oh, hopefully this broadcast better help to you. Yeah. Um, tips and tools. Hey, why don't we just real quick, I'll give, um, I'll give a few recommendations. I already know yours is the Ruckman Reference Bible, which I do highly recommend yeah, people get a Ruckman Reference Bible. I use Schofield as well. I also use Henry Morris Study Bible. And uh, I, I'll be honest, I don't use a ton of commentaries. I, I have commentaries behind me that I reference occasionally, but I really just like these study Bibles. And the problem with study Bibles is this, though, it, is people get them. And I know there are some bad ones out there, but these three, I like them. The problem with a lot of people who have carried for example, Schofield Bible for years is they've carried it for years and they've not read the notes in it. They've not even read the text in it. So, yeah. uh, you know, for a study Bible to do you any good, you need to actually look at the notes, compare the notes, reject the notes if they need rejected, if they contradict scripture um, and use them as a means to to spur your thoughts. Yeah, I you know I firm firm propagator of the Ruckman Reference Bible. It's got a hundred and eighteen appendices in the back as well, where he just takes random topics and just <laughs> talks about them. And trust me, sometimes they are so random they're not even in the Bible. Um, but that's really good stuff back there. I also have a Common Man's Reference Bible that I don't use a whole lot. Yeah, I don't not use mine a ton. Not knocking the guy, it's good stuff, but I don't use it a whole lot. Um, I use a Schofield a, a, a lot. I I have got the Companion Bible, Bullinger. Yeah, I've got that. Man, the the appendix is in the back. Now, if you're just reading through, like I do not recommend the the Bullinger the the Companion Bible as like your your daily reading Bible because there's so much stuff jammed on those pages and most of a lot of Greek. He was a big Greek guy. Um, but the appendix is in the back. If you can get past the Bible correcting um, some of that stuff is really good, mm -hmm. really good. And of course, you know, it, it needs to go without saying these aren't reference Bibles, but anything by Larkin is just phenomenal. You need to get anything by Larkin. That Those are good studies. That's right division. The last one on Grady's thing, which we didn't really hit because we've talked about it a lot, is right division. But if you want to learn how to rightly divide the church from Israel, the tribulation from the church age, the dispensations, body, soul, spirit, all that kind of junk, um, good junk. I didn't mean that, def, you know, derogatory all that kind of stuff you can find in Larkin. Anything by Larkin, I'm going to recommend. Yeah. Uh, you know, when I started my post out on how to study, the first thing that I mentioned is I use the dispensational viewpoint in order to study the scriptures. Um, the three men that I mentioned, Henry Morris, uh, C.I. Schofield, Peter Ruckman, there are three different levels of dispensationalism, but nonetheless, all three of them are dispensational. In their teaching. And, and I think if, if you're going to really get anywhere, you're going to have to get that dispensation thing nailed down. Yeah, I agree wholeheartedly. 
Well, it's been a good broadcast. We're ending right, almost right on the dot. Nice. All right. Well, yeah, been, been good. And maybe for, you know, some beginners tonight, or maybe some people who've been saved a while and haven't been studying to kind of get their feet wet. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I agree. All right, folks, listen, like and share the broadcast. We will, I won't be here. I'll be preaching up at Chad Reese's. So if you're in the Detroit area or reasonable driving distance, come and see us next week at Chad Reese's. I'll be preaching Monday, Tuesday, and Friday at Brother Reese's. But we will. I will not be here for the broadcast. So Brother Randy will have somebody on. Um, or not. He may just take a break next week, whatever he wants to do. But be back next week. We'll make an announcement on who we're having, if it's going to be a guest. And then we'll be back on that Thursday, uh, the following up Thursday. And I think if if it goes accordingly, we may we may have a really fun topic to talk about, but we're not sure yet. <laughs> <laughs> yes, we may have a really fun topic. Yeah. So, all right, folks. Well, listen, God bless you is our prayer. And like and share the broadcast, and we'll see you next week. Same Backwoods time, same Backwoods station.